Hello everyone, welcome back to Advent of Code. The saga continues. I'm I'm still here through at least day 12. Apparently, I just checked. Last year, day 11 is when I stopped. So if I make it through day 12 today, I'll do better than last year. I mean, it's also, you know, it's nice working in Haskell instead of, as I mentioned, you know, last year I was trying to teach myself Kotlin, which was more work because I was unfamiliar with it. And I just did not want to implement A star one more fucking time in my life, so I didn't do it. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we're doing day 12. Uh, I have taken the liberty of giving myself a head start on this. I read the problem description, thought about some ideas, also heard someone in the Discord mention dynamic programming, and then I was like, oh yeah, of course, that's how you should do this. So we've got, we've got, some, we've got some ideas here. Day 12, Hot Springs. You finally reached the hot springs. I didn't remember us like looking for a hot springs. Why do we want a hot springs again? Okay, this one, this someone just told us, oh yeah, sure, I'll help you find the hot springs. Why did I want one? Pipe maze. Why do I care about this animal doesn't have anything to do with the pipe maze? Giant floating island made of metal, parts to fix the sand machine. An oasis. Why am I looking for hot springs? Like, what the hell? Maps. I don't know. I don't remember anyone telling me I was looking for hot springs. Hot air is mentioned on day 9, day 10. Oh, here it is. Day 10 pipe maze. You find signpost labeled hot springs. Pointing in a seemingly consistent direction. Okay, sure. Anyway, back to day 12. You see steam rising from secluded areas attached to the primary ornate building. As you turn to enter, the researcher stops you. Wait, I thought you were looking for the hot springs, weren't you? You indicate that this definitely looks like hot springs to you. Oh, sorry, common mistake. This is actually the onsen. The hot springs are next door. I don't know how to pronounce Japanese, but this is like the Japanese public bath, right? Um... You look in the direction the researcher is pointing and suddenly notice the massive metal hel helixes towering overhead. Get it? Hot springs? This way! It only takes you a few more steps to reach the main gate of the massive fenced-off area containing the springs. You go through the gate and into a small administrative building. Hello! What brings you to the hot springs today? Sorry they're not very hot right now. We're having a lava shortage at the moment. You ask about the missing machine parts for Desert Island. Oh, all of Gear Island is currently offline. Nothing is being manufactured at the moment. Not until we get more lava to heat our forges. And our springs. The springs aren't very springy unless they're hot. Say, could you go up and see why the lava stopped flowing? The springs are too cold for normal operation, but we should be able to find one springy enough to launch you up there. There's just one problem. Many of the springs have fallen into disrepair. So they're not actually sure which springs would even be safe to use. Worse yet, their condition record their condition records of which springs are damaged, your puzzle input, are also damaged. You'll need to help them repair the damaged records. In the giant field just outside, the springs are arranged into rows. For each row, the condition records show every spring and whether it is operational, period, or damaged, hash. This is the part of the condition records that is itself damaged. For some springs, it's simply unknown, question mark, whether the spring is operational or damaged. However, the engineer that produced the condition records also duplicated some of this information in a different format. After the list of springs for a given row, the size of each contiguous group of damaged springs is listed in the order those groups appear in the row. This list always accounts for every damaged spring, and each number is the entire size of its contiguous group. That is, groups are always separated by at least one operational spring. Hash, 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 hash is always forward, never 2, 2. Or, for that matter, 1, 3, or 3, 1. So, condition records with no unknown spring conditions might look like this. But the condition records are, are partially damaged, and some of the spring's conditions are unknown. So, like, maybe this is the real uh, row, but we only know this much about it. Um... Keep in mind, where is it? There's a thing here. Um, 
duplicated in a different format. This list always accounts for every damage spring. So, like, this stuff here, the numbers are known to be correct. There's no errors in the numbers. We're to use the numbers to help us disambiguate the punctuation-based list and determine, like, how to disambiguate it. Equip this information. It is your job to figure out how many different arrangements of operational and broken springs fit the given criteria in each row. So in the first line, by the way, this is like, um, this makes me think of nonograms, right? Is a Japanese puzzle type. Well, I think it's Japanese. I mean, it doesn't sound English, but I don't actually know. Uh, it's, it's a puzzle type where you get stuff like this horizontally and vertically, and then you have to fill in a grid with like, okay, some of these are hashes and some of them are dots. And like the whole grid is just question marks. They don't tell you usually ahead of time whether any of it's filled in. You just have to use the uh, labels on the side. And usually you get a pretty picture at the end. I like nonograms. I did a video. Um, it was like a mix of Minesweeper. I did this it was a series, right? It was like five videos or something. Three videos. Five, I think. Of... Uh, a game that was like Minesweeper and Nonograms kind of mixed together. I don't know what it was called. Anyway. Um, so, yes, even before reading this, we can sort of think about this row and say, well, okay, we know these three hashes must represent this three because they're the rightmost group and they have the right length. Great. This is empty. And so somehow in these three cells, we have to fit a one group and a one group. Well, there's only one way to do that, which is have this blank and hashes on either side of it. Just remember, groups aren't allowed to touch. But down here, there's many ways to do it. This question mark has to be a hash to make the group the right size. But in each of these pairs of question marks, you know, either one of them could be on or off. Exactly one of these two and exactly one of these two is on, and so we have four possibilities. I assume it mentions this somewhere. Four possible arrangements, yes. So, we have to basically write a function that takes a row like this, and uh, outputs how many ways you could fill in the question marks, how many different ways you could fill in the question marks that would have this label, basically. Um, and then add, add that up for each of the rows that we're given. So I'm still a little bit... Um, one thing I haven't totally settled on is just, for some reason today, I feel like doing a lot less data modeling and just like working with characters and lists instead of my own, you know, custom data type. Uh, I already got my input, I think, right? Um, yeah. So we can see that, you know, there are rows with a fairly large number of question marks, but none of them have like 20, right? I mean, we could write a little program to say what is the most question marks in any given row. Um, and that might be an interesting place to start, honestly. Um, because the brute force approach to part one seems like it should work. We should be fast enough to handle that, I would think. The brute force approach being like, write a function to um, given a disambiguated row, i.e. where every question mark is replaced with either a dot or a hash, to come up with this label. Um, just try all possible replacements of question marks with either hashes or dots and count which one of them has produced the right label. That's obviously very inefficient. Um, you know, for example, we, we talked about this one here, right? There's only one possible way you could do this. And yet the brute force approach would involve trying eight different combinations for these three characters 
and then like labeling them all and then seeing which ones have the right label. Um, so, it the number you're doing a bunch of work that you could avoid if you thought about the problem more carefully. But as long as there aren't like you know twenty question marks in a single row, you're only doing you know a few thousand times more work than you need to, or something like that. Um, and computers are fast, so it should be fine. I heard someone say that the brute force approach for them took like 15 seconds to run, which seems fair enough. I have uh, an idea. I don't know what part two is, but I assume you have to be more efficient. And like I said, someone mentioned dynamic programming, which seems like the right idea to me. I assume you like it somehow makes it impossible for you to brute force. Increases the size of the problem or something like that. Like maybe just just says, oh, actually, this repeats five times, and so does this, or something like that, right? And then you have to like, you don't want to do like two to the fifty uh, <laughs> elements. But I I I want to do the brute force part for part one, even though I plan to throw it away for part two, uh, and I have an idea for a better part two, just because I think it's a kind of cool way to show off Haskell in a sense how easy it is to do part one with a brute force approach I guess um, so we do need a couple of types I'm just going to say my input is a list of pairs of string and string we're not even going to define a type for... We're not even going to parse the list of ints. Am I? I probably should. Sure, let's do that. It won't be too hard. Um, I will just work with those types today. Most days, I try to do like, okay, empty, ambiguous, definitely broken, right? Or not broken, definitely broken, and ambiguous. And I write some cool parser that puts... Anyway, today I don't feel like it. Um, so we need part... We need prepare. Prepare is map parse composed with lines, I suppose, where parse s is case span? I want span or break. Break is... I think I want break. Break is the one that matches... Yeah. So this, this will give me... Break takes a predicate and a list and gives you back a pair. The first element being all the... The prefix of the list that doesn't satisfy the property, the predicate. And then the second element of the pair is the first thing that does satisfy the predicate, and then the rest of the list. So what we can say is, we'll assume there's exactly one space. Um, so there's springs, I guess. And then a space cons to a label, in which case we will return you guys are going to love this shit um, or hate it. Springs, that's our set of uh, spring constraints. And read of, this is, I'm just never this lazy, but um, read of what is the ordering? I'll do it like this. Label error no parse. So let's just check that this actually does work, right? Uh, input to input, part one is identity. 
And so let's run this stack run and not run, but run. Yeah, looks like it parsed okay. Uh, we can look at the last element and see that it ends with one three. And there's this. So how how does that look? Um, two dots. Eight question marks, two hashes, and a dot. Looks right to me. Okay, great. So our parser is ready, as long as we're happy to have a really shitty data type as our input. <laughs> We've got that data type. I mean, this has all the information we need. It just like doesn't have domain types. It's using primitives instead, which is gross. But like I said, that's how I feel like doing it today. Um... One thing that we want is mm, I want a function that takes a row and labels it. The funny thing is I think all of this is only going to be needed for part one. So let's just put it in here where um, score mark groups, I don't know. Uh, it's probably just some composition of several functions, right? Is map length filter of where the I'll, once I'm done writing the function composition, we'll talk about it from right to left. Uh, group, I think. Um, does this type check? Oh, is group from data list? Yes. Okay, so in fact, let's for now um, make groups a top level function so we can play with it in the REPL. If I say groups of this, reload. Yeah, it says one, three, one. Perfect. That's what I wanted. So uh, we're, we first call group on the input string, uh, which partitions the list into chunks where all the elements in each chunk are the same, have the same value. So some number of spaces or empty spaces, those get grouped together. Some number of hashes, those get grouped together. Uh, question marks would too, but we won't have any question marks in the input we pass to group. So it, it groups the, the list into chunks. And then I just say, I actually only care about the chunks whose first element is hash, because that'll be all the elements in the chunk will have the same, be the same as the first element. And then I say, for each chunk, how long is it? And uh, that is the, honestly, I could just maybe get away with not even naming this function. That's, that's how to compute the label for um, I, I don't know, maybe a, maybe a, Maybe, maybe I need groups, maybe I don't. Well, it's, it's a nice little atomic piece of functionality to extract out anyway, whether it needs to be extracted or not is a different question. So part one is sum.map possibilities, I guess. Um, Possibilities of S and L is, oh, don't use L, it's a terrible variable name. It looks like a one or an I um, lab for label <laughs> is length of filter equal lab map groups traverse 
I think I can just say options of s um, options is options of question mark is well it's either a dot or a hash and options of anything else is just x there's only one choice I don't know, I'll use pure instead of writing an empty list. It's the same thing. So are we getting close yet? Um, Traverse. Okay, let's let's go ask for a. Well, this is this is the whole report, huh? All right. Well, what what type do I think possibilities should have? We'll see if GHC agrees with me on that. Possibilities. Well, I mean, obviously it will, right? No, it might not agree with the. Oh, hang on. Hint. There you go. I forgot I didn't uh, have the right type here. Okay, so I believe this is a solution to part one. Um, how does it work? Well, let's ask, ask a different question, which is how should it work? And then uh, we'll run it and see if it actually works. The idea is, um, gosh, traverse, man, what a function. So the idea is to turn each string s into a list of strings being the all the valid ways we could substitute something in for a question mark. Um, traverse. I always like reach for mapm and then I'm like wait that function is just traverse. Mapm was like the older name for it and it required monad but a lot more stuff works with applicatives and foldables now so traverse is the more general version of mapm. Um, traverse takes a foldable input wait a traversable input which has to also be foldable because traversable requires foldable and a function, we can actually look a little bit here. Uh, yeah, it's a traversable input. So it takes a, a T of A, where T is some traversable, in our case, list. And a function from A What is the type of, what are A and B and F in our case? T should be, I guess T is list and A is string? Yeah. So we have a function from A, i.e. string, to f of B, where f is our applicative, which is also going to be list. And we'll get a list of list of B, where B, I guess, is character? Yes. So A is string and B is character. Um, so we have a way to turn one of the strings in one of the characters in the input uh, into a list of characters, right? 
the question mark character turns into the list of characters, which is a string, dot hash. Given that, it uses the applicative context to decide how to combine those. So for lists, to combine things is to take the Cartesian product of them, basically. And so we, we get the effect of non-determinism, where it, it tries dot and it tries hash. It tries both every time there's a question mark and gives us a list of all the ways you could do a substitution. Given that list of way of strings, ways you could substitute, I call groups on each element of that list. It tells me all the ways that such each thing you could label would each thing you could try would be labeled. Then I filter for the ones that have the right label and I say how many of them were there. And that's how many ways it was possible to do this. So that's my I keep having a rung for some reason. That's my belief about how this function works. Let's see if it actually does. 6871. Seems plausible. That's the right answer. Great. Um, so we'll just we'll just commit that bad boy. Day 12 part 1. You know, and it's not the kind of domain type modeling that I often do, but I think it's nice to show off just how little you have to do when you're working with high level functions that are very like generic and abstract in how they work. There are a lot of tools for solving any problem built into Haskell's libraries. Um, if you view your inputs as, you know, your, your data structures as, if you think about the type classes that your data structures support, there's often a way to do things very simply, uh, or at least concisely. So let's have a look at part two. As you look out at the field of springs, you feel like there are way more springs than on the condition records list. When you examine the records, you discover they were actually folded up this whole time. To unfold the records on each row, replace the list of spring conditions with five copies of itself, separated by question marks, and replace the list of contiguous groups of damaged springs with five copies of itself, separated by commas. Yeah. So now we're going to have five times as many um, possibility, like question marks, on every row. More than that, even, because there's extra question marks added between each group. Um, which, which should be way too much to brute force. I'm actually curious, how long did, uh, did our solution take to run? It seemed pretty fast, right? Okay, five seconds. A little bit of that time was in the stack overhead of stack deciding whether it needs to rebuild or something. But you know, if we really want, why not? Why not? We'll we'll in the stack in stack work install bin. There's the executable for us that it built. Um, if I just timed this. You know, it's 4.1 seconds. So still, you know, fairly slow. And if we have five times as many question marks, then, I mean, we did two to the K work. Two to the five K work is, I don't know, a lot more. I'm like too stupid to figure out the ratio there, but it's it's pretty big. I guess it depends on what K is. Um, <laughs> so the point is brute force will not be sufficient here. Um, and this is where dynamic programming is going to come in. Because um, I, I briefly thought some about like, Oh, maybe I could teach this thing to solve nonograms, right? I could teach it, oh, you know, this 
is a three, and so there must be blanks around it because it matches with this, and then you can remove three from the end of the list or something, but, like, that's not how computers are very good at doing stuff. <laughs> um, you, you can only... You, I don't know. You could go watch and go back and watch my bomb bomb series um, for examples of how, like, teaching a computer to play a logical game actually tends to go. There just are too many special cases. Even if you write very abstract rules, there's still edge cases you haven't thought of, and problems that can't be solved with the methods you uh, thought to teach the computer. If you just teach it a way to explore the search space as quickly as possible, it'll get there much more quickly um, and accurately than if you try some set of heuristics. The you know the chess the chess and go people figured that out eventually, right? Um, somewhere in between, when they were teaching the computer a bunch of genius heuristics to fight against Gary Kasparov and just barely win, and then. Like, today, they're kind of using a mix of approaches where, you know, it plays, it, like, teaches itself heuristics by using neural network training. But in between those two times, they realized it's way better to just play games as fast as you can at random. And then, you know, whichever move leads to you winning most often, it turns out that's actually... A pretty good guess at the best move and then you have like some heuristics on top of that but anyway the point is just doing shit as fast as possible and exploring the entire search space is something computers are pretty good at so the 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 way i have in mind to traverse this input is and we'll just use these inputs as our examples here rather than like the expanded out ones because the principle is the same. My thinking is that I want a well, I guess I could start with a brief lesson on what dynamic programming is. There were some people in the advent of code, or sorry, the functional programming discord who were not familiar with that term. But it basically just means like memoization to if if you solve a program recursively or iteratively in the naive way, exploring a search space, sometimes you end up like multiple times in your process tree, you end up exploring the same search space twice. And it's kind of wasteful to do that if you already found the answer once for that search space. Um, you should save that somewhere so that next time you need to look that up, Next time you need to solve that, you can just look up the answer you found earlier. Um, and for problems with a large enough search space, you can save yourself a tremendous amount of time by not redescending into parts of it uh, more than once. So I imagine um, maintaining a map where the keys are descriptions of the subproblem. And the values are the solution to the subproblem. That's kind of how, you know, dynamic programming or anyway, memoization works. In many instances, dynamic programming is taught um, in an imperative context, like most stuff is imperative and mutable. Um, and so you end up having to like carefully structure your array in the right order so that you can like scan things and know that when you find encounter a subproblem and go to look it up in your array, you'll already have the solution there. So you, you make sure you explore the search space in the right order. With Haskell, you don't really have to do that. Um, you can, especially if there's a way to like, you know, for Liskov, no, not Liskov. There's some string sub substring thing. I it has highs and j's and. I can't remember who it is now. Um, string distance, I forget what it's called. Edit distance, Levenstein distance. Um, there's a dynamic programming approach to that where you actually only need one row of the array at a time and so it is kind of wasteful to save it all uh, in like a two-dimensional or three-dimensional array. Uh, 
But, um, you know, unless you're in such a case, it's kind of fine to just, like, save the whole array and look things up in whatever order. And with Haskell, as we saw in a previous example, uh, you can tie the knot. You can build a lazy map where each v the values for some keys refer to other values and that's where your dynamic programming is you say oh i need the answer to a sub problem let me look that up in the map um, and haskell's runtime system can figure out the dependencies between these things for you and so you don't really have to worry about doing them in the right order so i imagine having a map you could use an array it would certainly be more efficient i don't think that's going to be the bottleneck and i always have trouble figuring out how to use arrays so i'm not going to I imagine a map where the value is an int, how many s solutions there are to the subproblem, and the key is a pair of ints. Now this, this took me a little bit of time to figure out exactly what, how to represent a subproblem efficiently. My thinking is the pair of ints, one int will be, will be processing these things starting from the left. I guess these starting from the left. And one of the ints will be the index in the list that we're that we're working on. Assuming everything to the left of that is already handled and everything to the right of that we're figuring out how many ways to solve that. So maybe if we saw, you know, x the first element of the tuple is, is two. That would mean this. We've processed two characters already. Now we want to know how many solutions there are to ways to do this such that the label comes out right. And the second element in the array is how many of these groups we have already removed uh, or already handled. So... I think that's enough information to uniquely describe a subproblem. And we can arrange, I think, that that, that is, is all we need. Um, it is a little bit inefficient to, like, use lists in this way when I'm saying, like, the, um, like, we're going to have a list that has, um, you know, this many elements. If I say drop five of them, it's, like, a little expensive to drop five and then compute that, but it's probably fine. Um, if we were really concerned, we could use data.sequence, which is a type of linear container that supports efficient splitting uh, at arbitrary in indexing and splitting. And so we could just say like, you know, drop five and it would do that in log n time. But I think we can handle it being in log in, in linear time. That shouldn't be the real bottleneck for our algorithm. And we'll just work with lists. Um, So, maybe I should actually do something now, finally? Let's, we need data map lazy as M this time, because we do want to map where the elements are thunks that can look at each other to figure out how to finish building. And like, we don't want to have to build the map in the right order. Um, So sum.map possibilities map, well, unfold, where unfold of S and lab 
is we're gonna have to. Is there like um what's what's the function I'm thinking? Of? Intersperse or intercalate? I can never remember. Um, intercalate. Mm, doesn't seem quite right. Inters. I can show you guys this, I guess. Intersperse. An A and a list of A. Intersperse that element between the elements of the list, so. If I had, well, let's just play around in the REPL and see what happens. Um, import data list. That's fine. Uh, this is just in the REPL. So if I say intersperse, no, I don't want intersperse, right? I want it, I don't know, maybe I do. Intersperse comma between replicate five dot hash or I said I said comma but I typed the right thing which was question mark so what does this do this is not the input I wanted so do I want intercalate this whoops yes that's exactly what I wanted I always think it's going to be interspersed, and it never is, and I can't quite understand the type signatures of interspersed and intercalate well enough to understand how it maps to what I'm trying to do, so I always have to try it. So we put five copies of the input, and we intercalated the question mark into them. Now, for the other thing, I think we do want intersperse, right? We want intersperse... Um, Actually, we don't. Are we supposed to put anything in between the labels? No. Okay, so we don't need anything. We just need rep. We need something like okay. So say our input list is one, two, three. We need to repeat five, right? Mm. Pete is applied to too many arguments. Well, I don't agree with that. <laughs> um, isn't this how you're supposed to call repeat five one? Give us a list of ones, then repeat what? What am I? Oh, replicate, replicate. I forgot. Yes, sure. Yeah. So this will. Hmm? Nope, not what I wanted at all. I guess instead I need to write concat. Replicate five applied to one, two, three, right? Yeah, okay. Fine. So just give me five copies of one, two, three and jam them all up next to each other. So the only function we need from data list is, in addition to ones we already have is intercalate is um, intercalate question marks between replicate 5s and then concat replicate 5 of lab. Qualified as M, yes. Okay, so, you know, possibilities isn't written yet, but we're getting Um, possibilities of S and lab is subproblems, I guess is what we'll call it. Subproblems look up zero, zero. 
Um, we're just going to say, okay, I, I'll just assume all the subproblems are solved. Tell me what the answer is for having processed zero characters from the, la uh, the string and zero groups from the label i.e. the beginning of the problem, the whole problem, where subproblems equals um, m dot from list of do, probably, this probably makes sense, um, does it? I guess, all right, um, let's say, uh, we kind of have to get a range here, because we, we do, when you're doing this tie the knot of building a circular data structure, you have to have all the information to build it up front, so you can call it all, in, build it all in one go. And that means I need to know all the indices we'll never need to look up. But that's pretty simple. Um, we can do uh, springs or call it A. I don't know. We'll just label the possibilities by A and B. This is so awful. A comes from zero to length of S. And B comes from zero to length of lab. And then we just say pure of A, B. So that's our key. And the value is subproblem of A, B, I guess. Um, subproblem. Hmm. Yeah, right. This needs to be able to refer to the map of subproblems. Um, of A and B is um, let's see I think okay I think I have to write like Case drop drop a of the spring list and drop b from the labels, we have this tuple that we want to match on. Um, so first of all, we have, we have a few things we can say. If the list of springs is empty and there's at least one more item in the label list, then there are zero ways to solve the problem. We needed to put one more la labeled thing in, and there was no space left to do it. Um, what about if the label is empty, but there's still more stuff on the left? I think we can sort of handle that. I don't think it needs to be a special case like this. Uh, 
Um, oh, I guess we can say there's one way to solve this problem. If there's no strings left, springs left, and the label list is empty, yes, you have solved the problem. Congratulations. Um, so we've now handled all the cases where the spring grid or list is empty, and we can now match um, x, I don't know, I kind of hate this, x, x's, and y's. Um, we want to pattern match here on the first element in the list of springs. So case x of. If x is empty, then we can say fine. The answer is just sub problems look up a plus 1 and b because we have successfully processed one character from the left list in the only way possible by consuming it and not modifying the list of labels. Um, but I'm actually going to give this a different name, I think. Yes. Let's say, let's call this um, skip. Uh, I want this. So this where clause is going to be attached to this pattern and will therefore span all three of the patterns we're doing at this level, uh, which is good because I want to reuse skip. So, okay, let's, let's, let's write out the sketch and then we'll fill it in, um, use. And if it's question mark, it's skip plus use. Uh, is that right? I think so. Yeah, that seems fine. Um, yeah, this seems okay. So now we just need to define use uh, to be a number representing, because we're, we're now, we're looking at a hash and we have to use it to um, to um, it, it has to be the start of a group. We're going to arrange that we only get to this point in the code if we're starting a group at the current location. Um, uh, so let's say, gosh, this is getting a bit much. Uh, use is, and I think here we may have to case match on Y's, but that's okay. Um, yeah, probably. Case wise of, if wise is empty, the problem cannot be solved because we're trying to use a hash and we can't consume an item from the list. Yes, I believe that to be true. Otherwise, we are starting a new list or a, st a new group and we know how long we need that group to be 
because we've got the first item of wise telling us how big it is. Right? I think so. Um... Is there like a function in data list called split at or something? That's what I want. Yes, that's exactly what it's called. Amazing. Give me that function. Um, let um, prefix suffix be, what does split at do for, If I say, uh, if I if I try to take more items than there are, yeah, that's a problem. I want that to be like, sorry, I couldn't do that. Um, somehow but of course the site doesn't even allow that so okay so i need some more sophisticated way to check that the prefix of the list um is has at least y elements and that none of them are periods none of them are required to be empty Um, how do I, how do I do that? And now we also need that. Hmm. that the, the element after y is either question mark or blank. We, we need the group to be able to end. So we need to take like y plus one elements from the list. We need to like split it at y plus one and then somehow confirm. I don't know. What am I calling this function? I'm calling it... Oh, actually, I only need... I need to split it Y, I think. Because... I've already looked at the first character in the, in the input list, and I've determined that it means I want to use the item. Right? So I need that the next Ooh, is it actually y minus 1? No. I need it to Hmm. I need to start with y minus one hashes or question marks and then have exactly one period or question mark, right? So I kind of want to build, let's do this. Let expected equal Replicate y minus one of hash and then a dot. That's sort of what I'm expecting, but I'm not counting accounting for the question marks. Um, And then I'll split the list at y. 
Um, actual, we'll say, is prefix, no, zip width. const expected no not const are you crazy um match we'll call it match zip with match expected and prefix In if actual equals expected, then then we will have successfully matched the list, the list, and so we should say, fine, go ahead and keep recursing. Uh, which would mean what exactly? It would be sub problems look up uh, we have consumed y plus one items from the list, right? So it should be a minus y minus one is how many, oh, excuse me, a plus, it's how many we have successfully applied, a plus y plus one, because we've assigned y hashes and one dot. And then how, and it's B plus one, I think, because we've consumed exactly one more label number than we had before. And else, zero. We could not match. Um, this is obviously getting long. Um, let's just find match here. Match of question mark, no, our Prefix is the second one. Um, match of anything with a question mark is true. No, is not true. Match of a question mark is a. And match of anything with anything but a question mark. Mm, I'm running out of letters, guys. P? You. So if the prefix of the list we were working with has a question mark, then the result of matching is just whatever was actually expected of us. We can, we can work it either way. If we expected a hash, great, we'll put a hash there. If we expected a dot, we'll put a dot there. And if the result wasn't a question mark, then the result will have to be whatever was there in the prefix list. When we zip together the match and the expected, if they're not exactly the same length, then this equality test will fail. And if they are the same length, then whether we were able to match the elements pairwise should dictate whether the actual is equal to expected. So I think this makes sense. But this is going to be absolutely hell to test if it doesn't produce the right answer on the first try. So I'm going to have some work cut out for me here. Or I could just like get it right on the first try, duh. Don't be an idiot. Um, there's still some more to do. It has inferred some types I don't like, apparently. It thinks something's returning unit, huh? I think it thinks that possibilities returns unit. Interesting. Subproblems is a map from pair of int to int. How do you like them apples? Oh, and int. There you go. Let's 
subproblems is applied to too few arguments, you think. Oh, right, subproblems isn't a function. It's just a map. Subproblem is this function. Now we're getting closer to where it thinks the error is. Line 20. Oh, this should return an int. OK. So this actually compiles. I don't think, I didn't think it was finished. Is it? Yeah, I don't need split add, I agree. Oh, yeah, very funny. Characters are, I mean, sure. Any complaints other than that I don't handle all characters? Wait, why are you telling me about... I don't know how to have... Like, G my GCI currently... Oh, can I do M... How do you help... Um, how do you remove a module from your import list? I guess it doesn't matter because I hadn't I wrote an import manually. I didn't write say add a module. Um, add. I don't know, whatever. It's just gonna warn me about something that I'm not getting warning about here. Am I crazy? Why is it? Um Am I in the wrong directory here? No. Why isn't it giving me the warning here that I'm getting elsewhere? This is better. Now I'm getting some. So I'm not using the suffix. That seems like a problem. Oh, I'm calling split at, but... Oh. I thought split at was in base. Or was in data list. Okay. So I am still using split at, and I agree I still want it. Okay, so... Yeah, so we're not matching anything but those. I think that's fine. But let's, we should explicitly put an error in there on line 31. Um, oh, we'll even show C so it gets the quotes around it. Defined but not used, why is prime? Oh, do I not need that? I guess that's true. Because I'm I'm just recurring with a count, an int saying skip skip y. So I can I can do that. That's true. What else? Defined but not used suffix. Is this okay? I guess it is okay, but once again, I don't actually need the suffix because if I make a recursive call, I'll just say skip the suffix in prefix and look up suffix. So really what I should do is just say suffix is take y of x's. The prefix is take y and I don't need the suffix anymore. I assume something disastrous will happen when I run this. But it might not. Let's see what happens. Uh, that's a pretty big number. But, I mean, it might just be plausible enough, right? Wait, have I, I forgot this than that. There we go. If I have that and I have max bound of int, like that's way, way bigger. It looks like we probably fit all this into an int 64, which I don't know. That's enough for me to try it, I guess, as the answer. Wouldn't it be something if we were right here? Too low. Hmm. Okay. Let's think about why. It's absolutely impossible to have any ideas about why. Oh, man. Hmm. 
Uh, <coughs> it's too low. Hmm. Okay, did I... I mean, the easy thing to do would be to say maybe I got some numbers wrong here because this is... But I think this is right. Um... To solve the problem of okay, so the subproblems list is just. I guess we could also test this part two logic on our inputs from part one, right? Like on some test inputs. Well, okay, maybe, maybe what I can do is the following. That's at least a simple test that'll tell me something about how I'm wrong. Um, I'm going to grab one of these inputs that they give us in the test. Um, and I'm going to say part two, compose with prepare, mapped over. Oh, actually, I don't even have to map. I can just supply a string, right? Zero. That seems wrong. It might not be. Actually, now that I look at it. No, but you're, you're putting question marks in between each group. So shouldn't Shouldn't this return one still? Um, in fact, I feel like question mark dot, this should also tell us there's only one, right? Really? That seems wrong. No, actually that does make sense. Because this expands out to question mark dot question mark. Like, and then it's, it's this four more times. Why am I doing this in Tmux? I don't know. It's that. That, that is how this expands. And so there are Of course, it expands out to one, 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 
one. There's five of them. I don't know. Something's a little bit wrong. I don't quite know why. Is 16 right here? I don't think it is. Because there are six places we could put a single one. Six kind of contiguous groups, right? Um... So, and, and we must place a one in one of them. So it's sort of like there are, there's, we have to choose one section to not put the one into. So that gives us six choices. And then there are furthermore, uh, for all of these places in the middle, if we choose to put a one in any of these spaces, or a hash in any of these spaces, we have two choices about whether to put it on the left or the right. So there's something like two to the fourth, which is 16. One, two, three. I think I, I made this list too long, didn't I? Maybe that's one reason I'm confusing myself. There should only be five dots in this list. Because we repeated the input five times and then added some question marks between them. So this looks right. The, rather, this... this um, oh, in fact, what if I said part one of this? Eight. Yeah, so that makes sense. We have to put one one into each of the groups of question marks. There's no choice about which ones to put it in. It has to be all of them. And then for each of the ones that are too wide, there are two choices. So we have two cubed, which is eight possible ways to do this. Part two, though, thinks there are 16 ways. So one possibility is that unfold is wrong. Doesn't look wrong to me, though. I mean, I guess nothing ever does, right? Yeah. So if I go back to GHCI and I say part one, unfold, prepare. Um, something's just grossly wrong. Uh, why? Isn't the type of unfold input to input? No. What? Why not? Well, that's, that's a pretty important failing. So what, what type is there actually? Oh, I should be calling map unfold, of course. Um. Yeah, this doesn't take an input input. It takes one of these and returns another one of these. Okay. Map unfold. Oops, hey, I 
didn't do that turn. 16. But didn't I manually unfold it and get something that should be 8? Okay, yeah, that looks right. There. We repl replicated the one five times. We have five question dots, and all but the first one is preceded by another question mark. So there are four cho binary choices yielding two to the fourth or, or 16 possible answers. So I believe our unfold is correct. Which means part two dot prepare applied to this. Should should be 16 and it is. Okay, so I guess what, it's nice to have part one as a known working but slow solver for these, right? Because now I can go back to that more complicated input and say, part one, map unfold of this, please. And it'll take a little while, but it says, yeah, there's one. And if I say part two, but don't unfold, it says zero. So there's a problem here. Oh. Okay, I thought of something. A problem is that We have like a boundary condition at the end of the list. I'm saying we definitely need there to be um, y minus one hashes or question marks and then a period or question mark. But that's not quite true. The end of the list would also be acceptable there. So when our list ends with a hash or a question mark, we're like probably doing something wrong. How do I handle that? If actual is expected, then Sure, we can just like do that, but what if it's hmm. can I multi way if is that? So I kind of want to write a con statement, and those don't exist in Haskell, so we have multi-way if instead. I recognize pragma multi-way if. What is it called? Multi-way if expressions. Multi-way if. Am I spelling something wrong? Oh, I was supposed to say language. Okay, there you go. Cool. So now I can say in if, and how does this, yeah, if, um, like that, yeah, um, uh, 
Uh, and now I need to say length actual is um, y minus 1. And take y minus one and actual equals take y minus one of expected. Then there's exactly one way to do it, right? We reached the end of the list, and there were plenty of hashes up till there. But then right at the end, when we expected a dot, we found the end of the list. So we say, fine, there's one way to do that. What, what does this produce? A number that's larger. Well, okay, so first of all, we should run this. Hey, it says one. Okay, we might be in business. Um, this is still a large number, but it's definitely not as big as an int 64. Now it's too high. You're so picky. Hmm. Well, we can go test some more inputs um, from our, our little sample of test inputs, right? Um, here's a longer one. Part one, oh, let's reload. Part one, map unfold, unfold the pair of this. Now, there's an awful lot of question marks. This is going to take a while. But I think it's like not so long that I have to buy a new computer. So there, there are how many question marks in this? 5 times 5 is 25. Plus 4 is 29. Uh-oh. There are a billion possibilities here already. OK, maybe that is going to take a little too long. Let's, well, OK. Instead of doing this, we can just ask part two to run on those. Um, because this is a test input. It tells us the right answer on the web page. Come on, man. Give me back my REPL. God, it's in hell. Um, I will I will absolutely murder this process if somebody lets me. Oh no, there's too many. How do I know which one's the one I mean? GHCI, okay, I can kill this. I don't know what this other shit is, but. Um, Uh, kill, just absolutely murder it, please. Uh, 
It's still there. Oh no, I missed. Oh, it was this one! <laughs> ah, I got my GHC ID process instead. Oh man. Um, hello? I think I'm gonna say percent one here, right? Yes. How is it still saying stopped? You're okay, you are super dead now. Good. So now I can say reload and ugh, I can scroll way up here. Um, I was trying to run, well, this, but it, or no, this, but it took too long. So we're just running part one, compose with map unfold. Oh, we just want to run part two on that, right, okay. Part two, prepare, applied to, this. 16,384. That's, that's, if you guys look here, that's correct. Okay, that's very exciting. So we're, we must be pretty close to having a correct approach. And there's just like some edge case that we're not handling near probably the starter end of a list or something. Um, okay, well, let's try this one. One, also correct. How about this one? Sixteen, also correct. Hmm. I'm, I'm testing all the inputs from the test. All the example inputs. 2,500, correct. I'm hoping one of these will be wrong. This one is wrong. It's supposed to say 506250. So we're pretty close. We're off by a factor of like 10%. What's different about this list? Compared to the others we didn't get right. Or the others that we did get right. Nothing obvious, to be honest. So what, what can we say about doing this by hand, actually? If I look at this, actually, you know what, what what's part one say about this? 10. There's 10 ways to do this. So obviously, these first two question marks, why am I using my mouse, weirdo? Um, my first, the first two question marks here must both be actually dots. There must be nothing there. Because if either of them were a hash, the hash range would be at least four for the first uh, label. So that would be wrong. So those are dots. Um, and then we get to this one. We have this much space to put a two and a one in. And apparently 10 is the answer, huh? I guess that makes sense. Yeah, this is the triangular number for four that we're encountering, right? Because we have kind of four choices for where to start the two. It could start here. 
Then these two would be hashes, this would be blank, and there'd be four places to put the one. Or it could start here. There'd be two dot, two hashes, then a blank, then three places to put the one. Right? Or it could start here. Two hashes, then a dot, there'd be two places to put the one. Lastly, it could start here, then there'd be a dot, then this would be the only place to put a one. So yeah, 10. I agree. Which, okay, we know it's the right answer, so it's not a big surprise, but at least I can justify, like, part one. The problem is I don't really know how to extrapolate this to, like, doing part two. <laughs> the problem is there are so many degrees of freedom that you can't easily solve, like... You know, when, when we looked at... Um, up here... This one, right? You could kind of solve each sub-problem in isolation. Say, oh, there's two ways to do it. Uh, except for this one where there's one way. And then combine them because they... They each each of these labels takes up enough space that like you you can unambiguously tell where one there's a unique solution to each unfolding basically each section of the unfolded here that isn't true there's enough wiggle room left that you could put part of the three from the second unfold could fit inside of here right we could have the two start like this then a dot then a one then a dot. Well, 2.1 dot. But there's not really enough room for... For three more, for... Huh. I, I actually feel like you should be able to solve these independently of each other and just like... It's something to the fifth power. Like 10 to the fifth power, even. Where Where is the wiggle room? Oh, the wiggle room is we put one extra question mark in between each of these. Which is just enough space that you could put two dot one dot then this this and the extra question mark that goes in between the problems could be all hashes making them part of the three of the next version of the problem and then this would still be blank right no but then this would be a two again this this, this would have to be a three but it would actually be a two So why isn't this just 10 to the fifth? Oh, because there's a little bit of extra wiggle room in between these, right? So there's not, there's like 15 ways you could place the two and the one instead of 10, the triangular number for five. What's what's fifteen to fifth? Are we close to that? Fifteen. Oh, I have a I have a REPL here. Uh, fifteen to the fifth, please. Yeah, sure. That's too big. But remember, I mean, the thing is, fifteen to the fourth times ten. That's actually, I believe, the right answer, isn't it? Yeah, look, um, 506,250, that's the number we have here. 506,250 is 15 to the fourth times 10. So that's why that's the right answer. The question is, why am I getting the wrong damn answer when I do this? Ah, 
I'm in the wrong window. Help. Obviously, there's something wrong in this function. I mean, the, that's, that's, I can diagnose that much for free. What is wrong, though? It looked pretty good, right? You know... I was I had this brief thought, what if I just artificially put a dot at the end of the input list of the pattern, right? Then I wouldn't have this edge case here. I could just say actual definitely has to be expected. That seems kind of nice, right? Um So where am I using lab? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Very few places. I could just say lab prime is lab dot. Lab prime, lab prime, and we're like set, right? Um, and then I can just get rid of this. Put this back to a normal then form, then. Oh, wait, what? What do you mean types don't match? Oh, it should go in S, not lab. Oh, right. It's S prime, not lab prime. It's really tough to make sure to scan for uses of the letter S, though. I think it was just that there were just that many. So let's. Let's reload here and make sure I haven't changed how something behaves. Ooh, I changed it so much that it got the right answer. Oh, that's not really what I wanted to do, is it? Yeah, part two of that is still 2,500. Part two of this other one is somehow correct now. So there was something else about the ed condition I, apparently, that I was getting wrong, I guess, when I had that multi-way if version. There was some other way that actual could differ from expected, but still give me the right answer. That only happened at boundary conditions. And adding one extra dot to the end of the input fixed it. I don't know what was actually wrong. <laughs> Um, huh, well, okay, I'll take it, I guess. Um, let's get rid of multi-way if, I guess. Like, might as well get rid of these. And let's stack run one more time. We should get an answer that's slightly smaller than this, right? Whoa, that is way, way smaller. Okay, it's possible. I mean, we were off by some substantial margin for very small inputs. So sure, maybe, maybe I was off by a bajillion. That's the right answer. Well, that's interesting. Um... Oh, it's Gear Island. Look at that. I I don't know what the error ha I had 
there was. Adding a dot to the very end of the string certainly made it so you don't have this edge case, but Expected is, okay, there should be y minus one hashes followed by a dot. And the prefix is take y from x's, which should be y minus one hashes and then a dot. I zip with match the expected with the prefix. If actual is expected, then we recurse. And I used to have, I'll tell you what, let's get commit this. I mean, I think it's just gonna be the whole file, but I, I still, you know, I like to look through yeah, okay. Uh, sure, I don't want to look any closer than that. Day 12, part two. So now that I'm I'm safely cocooned in, in the warm embrace of Git, I can mess with my file as much as I want. I know I won't mess it up. So um, what I had here before was this. Um, and I had multi-way if, right? So this still compiles. And we can say, like, there's something wrong here, I think. Let's real quick confirm. Part two is still wrong on this, right? No, it's correct. What? This is the wrong answer, right? No, this is right. So I'm not sure what was happening. It might be that I fixed this with multi-way if, and I thought I ran this code. And, and got the wrong answer and typed that into advent of code and it said, no, you're wrong. But maybe I never actually did that. Maybe I tried this fix and then played around in the REPL and saw that I was still getting the wrong answer for test inputs. And so I never ran this for a real input. And I was getting the wrong result in the REPL because I forgot to reload, possibly. So maybe that explains why this fix wasn't, didn't seem to be correct, even though like looking at it, I can't see what this doesn't do that just adding a dot to the end does. I think adding a dot to the end is a better answer um, than this, because this is complicated arithmetic to handle an edge case. And this is like, oh, wait a minute. The difference, okay. <laughs> The difference is this. If I say S prime is just S, I bet I'm back to getting wrong answers again. Yes, okay. So this this is wrong. This is the wrong fix. And I don't understand why. If actual is expected, then fine. That's not the case we're wrong. 
if the length of actual is y minus 1, i.e. it's 1 shorter than we expected it to be because we're at the very end of the list, and the ones we did find, oh, you know what? I don't even need this. I can say if actual is take y minus 1 from expected. Sure. This shouldn't make a difference, right? We should get the same wrong answer? Yes, OK. But how does adding a dot to the end of something fix things now? Maybe, maybe I have a different boundary condition somewhere. In, in how I handle the end of the list. Huh. Why did I write pure? I should just just write that, honestly. <laughs> um Huh. I I don't know. I think I'm gonna be done for tonight, but if somebody watching the video can tell me what is wrong with this attempted fix. I'd be interested to hear it, I think. Um, let's get um, checkout dash p, throw away the multi way if stuff. Yeah, throw that away, split that, keep this, throw that away. And then we can just get commit day 12 simplify string okay hope you guys enjoyed thanks for watching and i'll see you next time